I'm so excited to be back with you today because we have more to talk about in terms of the mistakes people make when getting organized. Um, last time we talked a lot about the mindset mistakes um, against the framework of time, stuff, um, money, and space. And this time we're going to talk a little bit more about the actual physical mistakes people make. There's a lot of actual placement of things or not knowing the best way to store things, those kinds of mistakes that we're going to be covering today. But for those of you that don't know who I am, I just wanted to give a brief introduction. Um, I'm a certified professional organizer. I was actually one of the first, and yes, I sat for a test. Um, I'm also a money breakthrough business coach, and I've been studying how habits affect productivity and how money mindset can affect your clutter. So I bring all these things together to help create a really solid solution for you. You know, that, that balance between the control you crave and the freedom you desire. That's what all my clients struggle with. They want control, but they want the freedom. And how do you do that without feeling over-organized? So I do my best to help people navigate that and figure out the best solutions for them. Um, yeah, so I... I want to see if this sounds familiar to you at all. You get home from a busy day at work and you open the door and it feels overwhelming. There's just so much going on. There's so many stimuli coming at you as soon as you walk in the door because there's clutter around. You haven't had the time to set things up or you put off setting things up because you thought you had more time some other day. <laughs> you would have more energy some other day. But when is that day? When is this future point when you're going to have this aha moment that today is the day I'm going to get organized and take care of all these things? That's one of the mistakes people make. You can't do it all at once. It has to be a slow, progressive pattern of behavior that you set yourself up for success. So rather than thinking, I want to get organized or I need to be more organized, start thinking about how I can be better today than I was yesterday. And how can I set my environment up, the actual home spaces up for success for doing the thing I do in that space? So some of this is going to overlap with what we talked about last time, but I want you to continue seeing how everything is connected and how you can carve out little pieces of time and space and ease in your day by taking the time ahead of time to set yourself up for success. That's what it's really all about. Organized people don't do it just because they want to be more organized. It's so that they can do something else, right? Um, and today we're going to talk a lot more about containers as well, where the containers come into play, because that's People jump ahead all the time to the container. What's the right container um, for doing this job right now? Um, and what's going to solve this particular frustration right now without necessarily thinking about how it's going to affect things down the road? So, you know, are you going to decant in your pantry? Do you have time to decant every time you get home from the grocery store? Or are there just some key things that need to be decanted? So we're going to talk a lot about these, these more physical concepts um, as we go. Um, I have, a, I have so many exciting things to share that I'm like, okay, calm down. Let's take a moment and, and really, um, get clear on what we're doing. Um, so time, space, money, and things all are going to come into play. And there's a physical component to each one. So for time, the physical component is the actual hours in the day and what you can fit into that space, right? And the space is the actual physical thing. We talked last time about overflowing a glass of milk. So where can we figure out how to use these containers, the space around what we do as the limiter for how much can be in that space or in that time. It's going to help us figure out all the practical stuff, like how many pens can fit in the pen cup and how many eggs will fit in, in the fridge. You know, all of these things work together. It's the concept of space is limited. Time is expansive. 
if it's set up correctly. Um, but you can't have everything at once. You, you wouldn't have somewhere to put it, right? You have to really curate and discern what you're going to keep in a space and how you're going to keep it and how you're going to maintain it. There's going to be a lot of emphasis today on the decision-making piece of the puzzle because you can use your space and your time to help you make those decisions. Not everything is possible. While I on um, a philosophical level, I do believe almost anything is possible. But in terms of how you use your space and how you keep it decluttered, probably not everything is possible. If we limit it to a few options, it's much easier to deal with the stuff and the clutter, make better decisions. Um, so we're gonna check out a whole way of rearranging, um, I'm sorry, not rearranging. <laughs> Rearranging is what most people do, and we're going to not rearrange. We're going to actually get organized this time. We're going to talk about some storage basics. You know, uh, I think last time I mentioned some of my clients would put a pen down and then put a piece of paper on it and then look for their pen for 10 minutes. It's about putting the smaller stuff on top of the bigger stuff, the heavier stuff where you won't kill yourself picking it up off the bottom shelf or dropping it on your head off the top shelf. It is about weight and placement and frequency of use. So all of these things are going to come into play. What have you, have you ever stopped to think about that, right? Is it familiar when you set your stuff down when you come home? You put your keys somewhere, you put your jacket somewhere, you put your purse somewhere, wherever you happen to be. You kick off your shoes, you grab the thing, you get interrupted by a kid or a pet or a phone call. And then you go on about um, tackling that interruption and you don't come back to what you were just doing. So we're gonna talk more about what happens when you do these drop-offs and rearranging when we come back. The free one minute mail solution works for email too and you can download it at the link below or over there. Maybe it's a, the link. Before the break, I started to talk about how when we leave things for now or get interrupted while we're putting something away, it often leads to piles of clutter around the room, um, around whatever space it is. And our tendency is to let that go for a little while once we realize, oh, I didn't finish that, I'll do it later, I'll do it tomorrow, I'll do it on the weekend. And then other interruptions keep happening. So that pile gets bigger and bigger and bigger, right? And how to stop that is to actually start thinking about your process. What is it that would make it easier to not leave it till later? So we're going to talk a little bit about that. But I also want to talk about how our tendency when these piles of clutter come up is to take that time at the end of the week or, or tomorrow and think we're going to solve it by rearranging it. So we don't really organize it or make a decision. We just pick it up from where it's in our way and we put it down in another place to deal with later. So it's a self-perpetuating thing. It goes from here to there and over there and back here. And then one day you're like, where did I put my keys? Where did I put my bills to pay? They've been moved all over the house, so you don't even know where to look. Now you're looking in 87 different places instead of the one place where you keep that thing, right? So the first piece to help stop rearranging is to define that space. Where are the keys going to go? Are they going to live in the deadbolt lock on the door, a hook next to the door, a drawer, your purse, your um, a tray on the entry table? Where are the keys going to live? We don't have this problem with everything, which is why I find it so funny that people struggle with this, because we know for sure the ice cream goes in the freezer, right? We don't ever accidentally put it in the bathroom or we don't leave it on the entry hall. We know it goes in the freezer, so it's more likely to end up in the freezer. That's all defining your space is, is actually looking for the place it makes sense for that thing to be. Sometimes we have... Um, a tendency to have things in more than one place, thinking it's gonna be more convenient that way. If I have scissors in 12 different places, I will always have scissors when I need them. 
While that sounds great on the surface, this is one that totally depends on how you process things and how much space you have. It totally makes sense to have a second vacuum upstairs if you have carpet and rugs upstairs. It does not necessarily make sense to have 87 pairs of scissors all over the house because you will never put them away. You'll just kind of in the back of your mind always be thinking, there's another pair around somewhere. Let me go look for them. Instead of knowing I only keep scissors in the knife block, in the desk drawer, and um, maybe a pair in the closet for taking tags off. You have to define where you're going to put things so you know where to return things once they're used. That way, even if you get interrupted, you get to go back to it and pick up where you left off and know where you're going with those things instead of feeling overwhelmed and like you have to leave it again till later. Um, one of the things that you can check out is the One Minute Mail Solution. It is the free um, resource on the website. So it's morethanorganized.net slash mail. That's M-A-I-L dash I-N dash one O-N-E. Um, it has a whole cheat sheet on how to set up a bill processing center. And it works for all the different electronic information and um other pieces of information that come in the mail. And so it will get you in the practice of setting up a designated spot and putting those things in those spots on a regular basis. That's why I recommend it. It doesn't apply just to the mail. It's just the starting point. Um, so when, when people struggle with setting up definitions of things, where things are gonna live, it's typically because they aren't really clear where to start. And this is where it doesn't really matter where you start, but if you practice with the obvious things, it makes the things that are a little bit more difficult easier because practicing um, is definitely what makes things easier in the long run. The more you practice, the easier it becomes, the more muscle memory there is, the more connections in your brain and that kind of thing. So if you start in the kitchen and we already know the ice cream goes in the freezer, where do you keep the cereal? Where do you keep the pots and pans? Where does it make sense to put the flatware that you um, eat with every day? And do you know the right um, terminology for the different things in your kitchen? Often, I find that people don't know the difference between certain things, and so they group them together, not realizing that their function is actually different. So this is where creating some zones that will help you define spaces uh, come in handy. So is this a kitchen item involved in prepping the food or storing the food or cleaning up after the food or eating the food, right? Is it any of those things? And depending on how you use your kitchen, do you need some specific things? Like, do you bake or never bake? Do you need a whole defined baking situation? Do you need a coffee station or a tea station? Do you need a place where your kids can't access the adult snacks versus the kids' snacks? These kinds of daily usage criteria help you figure out the best place to keep things. It doesn't make sense to keep your kids' dishes in a top shelf if you're trying to teach your kids to get their own plates and help you put them away. It makes sense to put them on a lower shelf where the kids can actually reach them. Is this starting to come together? Um, I hope so, because every place you can figure out what's obvious to belong here right? Your bathroom should be for um, hygiene and getting ready and body care, correct? You don't need to keep a whole bunch of extra stuff in there. Many people don't keep a whole lot of extra stuff in the bathroom, but sometimes there's like bed linens in there. It's like, I'm not really clear why these are in the bathroom. Um, so make sure you kind of define the purpose of the room, then what you need for that purpose and then where in that space would be the easiest, most convenient place for storing that thing. Keeping in mind the weight of the item and the frequency of use. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense to keep a product that you only use once or twice a year, maybe your roasting pan in prime real estate where you, would, you could keep your skillets and saucepans that you use on a more regular basis. So that roasting pan can go up or down on a lower back corner shelf. Um, so these are the things that make rearranging easier. 
We're going to have to take a break, but when we come back, we're going to talk a little bit more about um, keeping extras and the parts and things. The Streamline Clutter Solution online course will help you gain control of your stuff and space. What are you waiting for? The link's around here somewhere. Before the break, we were talking about how not having a place to store your things or not knowing where to put your things gives way to constantly rearranging your things and then really never knowing where they go. Um, and there's one more piece to that that I wanted to talk about before we move on to the, the extra parts and, and the problems that can cause. And that is, I've been surprised how many of my clients and friends and family will give up throw their hands up and say, I can't be organized. I can't keep the rest of my family from cluttering stuff up. And they give up and they say, I'll show them I'm not going to clean up either. And then it just makes everything worse because now everybody is messing things up. So having that attitude of blaming others for the disorder and having and maybe seeking some revenge about that disorder is never going to solve the problem and in fact makes it worse. So different people notice and are comfortable with different levels of clutter. So if it's something that's bothering you, you need to be the one that takes the reins and creates the places that make it easy for everyone to help you out. And you have to communicate that you have now created a home for the backpacks to go, that you've now created a place for the dishes to go, the dishwasher after you use them so that they aren't on the coffee table. It's up to you to actually communicate these things and while they are learning to not become a nag about it, but to refresh their memory, to reward them when they help you out and to go ahead and pick up those socks and put them in the hamper because it takes so much less time to just pick up the socks and put them in the hamper if it bothers you than it does to complain and nag and gripe about it um, to all your friends and your spouse or your kids. And that is what leads to mass quantities of clutter. It's that resentment. And so take it upon yourself to be the one that is in control and in charge of that for now. This is the one time I say for now because as soon as you start communicating and as soon as you raise your standards and set the expectations for the rest of the people in your environment, they will hop on board eventually because you are maintaining that. And then, you know, think about it. When you were a kid, did you have a grandma or a great aunt that always had a really clean house and you weren't allowed on the couch or in that one room, or you, you felt a little more like helping clean up on your way out the door just because that was the expectation in that place. That's what you can do for your own family, but you have to take the lead in that. So I just wanted to throw that out there because it's an often overlooked thing that it's not about blame and it's not about revenge. It is about what kind of environment you want to create and craft for your own family and or workspace. Um, all right. So having said that, the next thing that really adds to a lot to the clutter problem problems I see, and this is both offices and homes, is the extra parts and pieces. So let's say you buy a set of dishes and there's teacups and saucers because it's an old fashioned one <laughs> and you don't really use teacups and saucers. Guess what? You don't have to keep the saucers and the cups. You could let those go and keep just the bowls, the salad plates and the dinner plates. Now you don't have the extra things in the way, right? What if there's a whole bunch of extra parts that are too young for your kid, but you have kind of advanced kids, so they're okay with the rest of the toy. You take away the choking hazards part and you use the toy. Um, there's always extra hardware when you get furniture, especially the assemble it yourself kind. They try to cover themselves by giving you extra hardware. Doesn't mean you need to keep that extra hardware. So I always say, you don't need the boxes either. Let's just talk boxes and cords. Once you have things set up, you can let go of the extra parts because you have the configuration that works for you. You don't need to keep the configurations that work for everyone else or some other people. Um, and you don't need to keep the backup cords from the thing you had before because you have the new cords now, right? And now connectors are changing all the time. So just 
take a look at that kind of stuff. The extra parts and pieces that come, um, you know, in when you buy things at Costco, sometimes that package actually has 87 pairs of scissors in it and you just needed the pair to cut the paper in the craft room. <laughs> what do you do with all those extra scissors? Do you actually need them all? Is it something you actually need? Or do you already have a pair of kitchen shears? Do you already have a pair of um, tin snips in the garage? Do you already have a pair of manicure scissors? What scissors do you need? And how many of those can you possibly keep? If you don't keep just your favorites, you're always going to be using the wrong ones and pissed off and frustrated that you can't get the thing done in the right way. So this is where having the right tool for the job is also going to come into play. What is your favorite one to use? You're much more likely to use it and to return it to the right place. It becomes the precious object that helps you get the thing done. You're much more likely to keep track of it and where it belongs and take care of it. Everything we buy and bring in, we have to take care of for the rest of its life. So even if we're not going to be around and it's still going to be around, you have to plan for who gets it. Who are you going to give this thing to? Who's going to take care of it once you're gone? I know it's probably just a piece of plastic or metal, but if you start thinking about it that way, it helps you buy better quality things that you can pass on with grace and ease and not, oh, I don't want that junk. Um, so all of these little decisions along the way help make uh, better decisions and help you make uh, a great environment for everybody to be nurtured and supported and do their best work and live their le best life without getting upset that all this stuff is in your way. It's always all connected. One thing leads to the next thing leads to the other thing. Your thoughts lead to your emotions, lead to your actions, which create more emotions. So um, always think things through at least a couple steps. Get in the habit. Start doing that. Um, so the other thing to think about in terms of the extra parts is how many is enough. Two isn't always better than one because looking for one is so much easier than looking in 87 different places for 87 different possibilities. And they all end up in the one or two places because no one knows that where the others live, right? When you have too many pens, you can never find a pen. When you know where they go, you are able to find them. So think about that, right? How many do you need? How many multiples do you need to take care of? And is it on the verge of a collection? Which we'll talk about a little bit more when we come back. Get the Streamlined Paper Solution online course and learn quick ways to control interesting information. The link's here. Before the break, we were talking about all the extra things and how you have to take care of all those extra things and how that can become a problem. Um, but it leads to how many extras does it take to make a collection? And I would have to say... It doesn't. <laughs> um, what makes a collection is how you curate it and how you take care of it and how you um, put it on a spreadsheet so you know exactly what it is. So real collectors treat their collections as precious. Accidental collections are because you didn't make a decision and now you're trying to justify keeping it or why you still have it. So I want you to think about that. It's not about keeping the original box. It is about how you keep the thing in that original box. I have lots of clients that have lots of precious things that they didn't take care of because they didn't create a space for that thing to live. So if you have a collection, and by all means, I have nothing against collections, keep it well and keep it safe and keep it protected. Um, but enjoy it. So have your things on the shelf behind you. Have um, the posters hung on the wall. Have the Navajo rugs on the floor where you're using them and can enjoy them all the time. Have the others stacked in a corner where you can still see them, but they're a little more protected. This is what um, it means to have a collection. Are your comic books boarded and bagged? 
<laughs> are they kept in a nice dark place where they don't fade in the sunlight? All of these things come into play. Your dolls that now have bugs in their hair aren't as valuable as the ones that you took care of and um, dusted on a regular basis. So just keep that in mind. How many is not the point. How well you take care of them is. So this is always the leads into the saving things for a reason, right? Well, I might need it someday. Somebody gave it to me or um, it's for special occasions. Those are the three most frequent reasons people give for the just habit because, right? That's the reason. So let's examine these a little bit. The someone gave it to me, so I can't get rid of it. Well, now it's yours and you get to decide what to do with it. You're not going to forget the people that gave you things if you give away the thing they gave you. At least I hope not. That would be terrible if you gave away, if you forgot all about your kids just because you gave away some of their artwork, right? Or threw it away. Because not everything is precious. Some of it is just an example and a sample or a template. You don't have to keep all those. You need to keep the things that tell the story of that person if it's memorabilia. But if it's just a gift, we all have that situation, right? I used to collect flamingos, but I had very specific flamingos that I was looking for. They were um, from the 30s and 40s and early 50s. They were um, somewhere between art deco and mid-century modern, and they were very specific you know, specific to a time and place. And yet once I had a few, people started giving me all kinds of flamingos. I had um, not just lawn flamingos, but I had flamingo cups and I had flamingo hats and I had all these things that people kept giving me because I liked flamingos. But it was a very specific set of flamingos that I was really excited about. Not every flamingo that ever walked the face of the earth. So I got rid of a lot of those things and some people were a little offended, but the people that really love me didn't care because it was the thought that counts. Okay. So if it's something you're keeping and you only pull out a couple times a year to show the person that gave it to you that you still have it, that is living your life on someone else's terms. And I want you to really consider that. If there are strings attached to the gifts you give, they may not be worth keeping at all. Okay, I, w I just want to be really serious about that. We keep so many things because we should or we don't want to offend or confront someone. And if there's a confrontation involved, it probably wasn't a good gift in the first place. So you need to live, eliminate that from your life right now. Okay, um, so keeping it for special occasions is kind of along these same lines. This comes up a lot with bath products and perfumes and clothes. I only wear that when I go to the opera. Okay, well, when was the last time you went to the opera? Is this something that happens to you regularly? I happen to live in a place with an opera and lots of people go to the opera fairly regularly, but I've also lived in areas where there is no opera and it's a very infrequent thing. So you don't need to keep it, right? Um, there's some things that are a special occasion that aren't necessarily a special occasion, but for something so specific that it rarely comes up and yet you have it. So do you really need deck shoes if the only time you wear deck shoes is when you go sailing and the only time you've ever been sailing was when you used to date that one man that had a sailboat? Maybe you don't need the deck shoes anymore. <laughs> See, think about it. What happens when you have a t-shirt that you only wear on Tuesdays when it's raining and it's a month ending in R? Do you need six of those? Are you saving a whole bunch of clothes because you use them when you work on things, when you work around the house or you garden? How many of those outfits do you need? Or do you use it that day and then throw it in the wash and then you can wear it again in a couple weeks when you do something else? So those things are special occasions as well. There can be toys that only get used when certain people are at the house. There can be um, certain serving pieces or things in the kitchen that you only use when you do that one thing. But how often do you do that thing? Is it worth keeping the giant lobster pot if you've moved to the Midwest? Maybe not. <laughs> Maybe 
I don't need as many pairs of rubber gloves and one specifically set aside for peeling green chili once I live back in New Mexico and other people do it for me. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of things that are very specific that we hang on to. And if you reevaluate where you are in your life right now, you may not need it anymore. So that's another place to look for some clutter to let go. And why not wear that dress that makes you feel fabulous one day when you're home alone and you need a little cheering up. I've noticed, you know, everyone during COVID has been talking about how they're wearing loungewear and pajamas to work and stuff. And I still get dressed every day to go to work because it helps me feel like I'm in work mode. So I didn't ever stop getting dressed um, for work. So think about that. You can bring some more things in just because you can. After the break, we're going to talk about um, matching how you keep things with who you want to be. And I'm Miriam Ortiz Pino. This is the Streamlined Connection on the Bold Brave TV network. And we'll be back in just a minute. Get the Streamlined Paper Solution online course and learn quick ways to control interesting information. The link's here. Before the break, we were talking about what to do with all that stuff you have hanging around for some special reason, or maybe it's just an excuse, and um, it just reflects the fact that you haven't been able to make a decision about it. And so start making some decisions. And the best way to do that is to figure out who you are, who you want to be, and how you want to be. So this is something many people shy away from. They don't want to look too deeply. They just want to go along to get along. But it's one of the reasons you don't make great decisions or clutter piles up because clutter is simply postponed decisions. And by thinking it through, first, you get to have just what you need right where you need it when you need it. So let's go back to the kitchen because it's an easy example. Let's say you would like to be the kind of person that bakes. Well, do you have a set of measuring spoons? Do you have a set of measuring cups? Do you have a mixing bowl? Do you have some stirring spoons? Do you have a mix master or a KitchenAid? What do you have that makes you a baker? Now that you have those things, how often do you use them? A writer isn't someone that has a best-selling book. A writer is someone that writes every day. A best-selling author is the person that uses that writing to get it into a format that is book-like and can be purchased by other people. See where I'm going? You can be a writer without being a professional writer. You can be a baker without being a pastry chef, but you might be. <laughs> you might aspire to do that, but what have you put in your path to make that happen? That's what I talk about when we're, we're looking at this aspect of who do you want to be and how do you want to be? You have to consider both to know what you need in your life to make those things happen. Um, and and uh, I was just having a conversation with someone about how we learn things and how that can affect how we incorporate new ideas and new information and make things better for ourselves. And really, it's about understanding how how does it work for you do you know enough about how you learn to make that happen do you know enough about the concept to understand what they're talking about there are lots of tips and tricks published in magazines and online and and your friends will tell you that make no sense when you look at it a little bit deeper the number one that happens all the time and all my clients have a problem with it is that old adage of touch a piece of paper once. Stop believing that. You cannot physically process a piece of paper by only touching it once. Let's examine that, right? You get an envelope in the mail. You need to open that envelope. You have to take the piece of paper out. You have to see what it is. You have to then decide if you're going to deal with it right now or later. So you can move it one step forward in a process but you can't like go get the checkbook and the calculator and a pen while you're just still holding that piece of paper for every single piece of paper that crosses your path, right? That's ridiculous. So as soon as you set it down, you've already failed. And then 
you don't know what to do and you did it wrong. And so it goes into this whole spiral of how I am not good at being organized and I don't know what to do. And I will just put it over here for later because now I'm depleted and all my energy is gone and I feel like a failure. Don't buy into it. Think about what your thing is. Is this a bill I need to pay? Yes, let's put it in the bill paying center. And so it's there when I batch my bill paying. It's not touch a piece of paper once. It is make a decision about the next step in the process for that piece of paper. And that is a step that is left out of almost every single magazine article or online um, venue that I've heard that adage used. They don't say next step in the process, they say ever. <laughs> so think about that, right? How many of those things are there? Put it in a bin, put it in a box. Why? I, I just saw a picture online yesterday of a pantry that, that one of my um, colleagues did. And um, I don't actually know this person, but she's a, another professional organizer. And there's a bin around four boxes of cereal and it says cereal on the bin. And it takes up a lot of depth on the thing. And I realized, well, to get the cereal out of the bin, you have to take the whole bin off the shelf to grab the box you want because there isn't enough clearance to tip it out. Whereas if it's just on the shelf, it's like a book on a bookcase and you just pull it out straight. So those are the kinds of things you want to be taking a look at when you figure out who and how you want to be. Do you want to be a person that has a pantry that's fully labeled, decanted, and sectioned off in containers? Or do you want to be the kind of person that can reach into the pantry, grab a box of cereal without spilling a bunch of other things, and um, have your kids help you put it away, right? So these are where connecting what you want with how you want to be helps you solve the organizing dilemma that may be coming up for you. Um, again, look at, is it bothering you? We got the communication that goes on here when we're talking about who we want to be and how we want to be. Do you want to be able to say, hey, can you hand me the measuring cups? They're in the second drawer on the left in, in that um, center section. Yes, the stainless steel ones will do. Or do you want to be the person that says, I need the measuring cups. Who's seen the measuring cups? Where are the measuring cups? Right? <laughs> It's so much easier when you know where things go, where they want, where they are to get help or to do it on the fly and or to begin establishing some muscle memory around where the keys go, where you put the dishes away, where you put the lotion away, where the pen is, where the bills are. All of these things become muscle memory when you know where to put them and you practice putting them where they go in between using them, right? It doesn't make sense to have a place that you define it to go and then you don't practice putting it there. That'll just lead to failure and um, frustration. And you'll have to start again by rearranging and then remembering that you don't have to rearrange, that you should actually figure out a place to put it and create the habit by practicing putting it there regularly each and every time. Which reminds me, there's this very cool concept called ridiculous memory and it is a way that tricks our brain into remembering to do new habits. And that is if you mess up and don't put your keys on the hook, when you find your keys, you got to put them on the hook again, take them off the hook and then go on about your business so that your brain remembers picking them up off that hook. Get the Streamline Time Solution online course and learn easy ways to control your time and tasks. Links here somewhere, down there I think. Um, just to recap what we've gone over today, uh, we've learned that rearranging is bad. It's better to actually make a decision instead of con constantly putting off that decision till later. Um, we talked about how having a place for everything helps us start using all the little tiny bits of incremental improvements that can happen in terms of muscle memory for where things go, saving time when you know where things are, and delegating and or getting help from the rest of the family. We talked about how communicating what the systems are and where you expect things to be helps you up-level your standards and expectations for everyone involved in the space, and you're much more likely to have a good result. And we talked about picking what you want to keep, not listening to what others want you to keep, and 
not saving things for a special occasion. We might as well be using the things we have and using the best versions of them so that we have more enjoyment in our day-to-day -day life, helps mitigate some of the frustration and brings just that little extra um, spark of joy and delight to your day. That's mostly why I like having um, some extra special things that I use on a regular basis. The bottom line is all of these things involve taking a look at how your life is going so far and how you can make decisions that help you make it better, just incremental better every day. Um, I'm super excited and I don't want you to forget about the one minute mail solution. It is available at morethanorganized.net slash mail dash in dash one. It's going to give you the basics of how to start using a small system that has just five steps involved, locating five different kinds of things and practicing putting them there. It'll get you started on the process. Um, so I don't want you to forget that. But also, what what's coming up, right? We've got some good stuff coming up. I've got some book guests booked <laughs> um, for the next few shows, and I'm really excited to, to share some of these colleagues with you. Next time, it's going to be Julie Bestry of Best Results Organizing. She and I have known each other for about nine years, maybe longer. I've lost all track of time these days, but um, she specializes in paper, and so it's a great segue to um, have her out her methodology and her approach to paper, which is all about fear and tickles. And so you don't want to miss that. You're going to love it. Um, as always, your comments, feedback, and questions are welcome. When I get questions, I will answer them. And you can send those to Miriam at morethanorganized.net. And tell all your friends about the show. It's so much more fun to have some camaraderie and, and friendship as you start implementing some of these ideas. And you can find even more exciting free resources and or figure out um, other ways to work with me at morethanorganized.net. And just be sure to visit there regularly. And, you know, I'm so excited that we have this show underway and that we get to start looking at all the different ways we can connect and streamline your life. So have a delightful day. I'm Miriam Ortiz-Pino. Thanks for stopping by.